Good morning to each and every one of you. Um, I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I would be remiss um, if I did not give honor to God, um, who is the head of my life, as well to um, my pastors whom you've heard from, and um, to the Academy of Preachers, um, and to the distinguished Harvard University. All of you here are um, by far some of the finest people um, that I've had the opportunity to meet in my entire life, and it's such a wonderful blessing to be here today. Um, let's do this, and let's pray. God, we thank you um, for being who you are, so awesome and so majestic, so wonderful. And God, we ask that even as we're here today, that God, you will allow us to be empowered and inspired by your word, so much so that we'll run and we'll tell this entire world that you've risen and that you're still in control and that you're God and that besides you there is no other. As I take this time um, to humble myself and stand behind your sacred guest desk, I ask that you minister to your people and that you encourage these souls here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Um, I would like to share with you um, real briefly, um, my pastor, pastor, the late pastor William O'Neill, um, was my spiritual father um, when I was 11 years old, and he passed a month from now last year, so November, the end of November last year, he passed from cancer. Um, it was absolutely one of the most difficult moments of my life um, to lose someone that I could trust, to lose someone who I was so close to, um, and someone who I respected um, so immensely. And upon his deathbed, he called me into the room and he asked everyone else to exit and as I'm laying there, or he's laying there, and I'm actually sitting next to him, um, he says to me, and at this time his voice was very weak, he could not um, speak as strong as he's always spoken. And he said to me, um, he says, son, I want you to discover greatness. I'm standing there and I'm listening, trying to understand exactly what he meant. And, and I asked him, well, what do you mean? He said, well, let me give you a few steps. He said, step one, but I'm only a child I'm listening. And I don't know if anybody's ever had any experience with someone who's gone through cancer, but towards the end um, of, of their journey, um, they become very wise and very interesting people. Um, and he goes on, he says, step two, He's real silent. And he says, water. So I start writing down water. He said, no, give me water. <laughs> <laughs> so I hand him water. And as I hand him the water, um, he's still silent. He says, step three. So I'm saying, okay, you've got step two. <laughs> and, and so he goes on, and, and, and I begin to you know, think about that, uh, even as I begin to... Um, look at Genesis chapter 37. Um, we've been asked to tell a story, and Joseph's story is by far one of the most inspiring um, in my life. And so Joseph, in the chapter, 37th chapter of Genesis, if you know you have it, um, you can go there quickly with me. Um, but the amazing thing about this story, and I'm gonna only read um, verse 28 out of the King James Version, um, and he says, um, then there passed by Midianites merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit. It says, and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver and brought Joseph into Egypt. You know, and the amazing thing about Joseph's story is that for me, it resonates as a story of victory and, and vindication. It resonates with me um, because in Joseph's story, we find here turmoil and triumph. We find um, pain and promise. And we find forsake and fulfillment. Um, in this story, we find deceit and destiny. It's, it's amazing how um, both of the worlds show us how we reach a place um, where we can ultimately seek greatness. And so I'm, I'm, I'm listening to my pastor speak to me in this story, and he says, I want you to discover greatness. And so in this particular passage of scripture, Joseph is sold into slavery. So even if I would say a topic, I would say um, he was sold into greatness. Yeah. 
Uh, I would like to propose that today Joseph was sold into greatness. So what happens for me in this particular passage, and I hope it happens for you, is the 28th verse for me is a turning point for this particular story. Because um, what we have to first do is take a look at what happens before the 28th verse, um, and then we can parallel it and um, compare it to what happens after. So what happens before the 28th verse is we find Joseph um, in, in a place where he begins to share a dream that he had with his brothers. They're, they're, Joseph is a brother of, of clan of 12, and so his father is, is Jacob. And so um, Joseph was favored by his father. His father loved him. He was the beloved son of his father. So he shares this dream with his brothers about how one day um, he's seen in this dream that um, his sheaves were, um, they, they were a lot taller than his brothers and they begin to bow down and obey his. And, you know, they became very upset. They begin to hate him. And, and the Bible tells us that hated him so much um, that they begin to conjure up a conspiracy to get rid of him. And so around the 20th verse, we find um, that um, the Bible says that as they were getting ready, they, they were getting ready to slay him. And as they were getting ready to slay him, um, they, they despised him so much because they seen him coming from afar and they said, there comes this dreamer. Here comes this dreamer. And in, in the 20 verse, it says, now come therefore and let us slay him, cast him into some pit. And it says, and we will say some evil beast has devoured him and we shall see what will become of his dreams. And I would like to propose that possibly that the main character of this particular passage of scripture is not necessarily Joseph, but it may be Joseph's dream and his destiny that takes the main stage as the character of this narrative. That it wasn't really all about Joseph himself, but the destiny and the purpose that was assigned to Joseph's life that really made his brothers upset. Maybe it wasn't just the fact that Joseph looked good and had a nice coat of many colors, but maybe it was because there was something about Joseph and his dream that caused his brothers to become upset that they were, not, they were less concerned about Joseph the person and more concerned about Joseph the anointed one. And so what happens now as it goes on, we realize that Joseph is young. He's one of the youngers of his brother. He has a younger bro um, brother named Benjamin, but he's one of the youngest brothers. And, and so I would imagine that even in this place, his brothers are upset. One, because you're telling me that my young brother is going to tell me that he's better than me. For some reason, somehow, he's, he's bigger than me, and that one day we're going to bow down to him. And, and in so many cases, as young preachers, we're here today, and we can all agree, and we can all um, have some level of, of relatability that in some place, in some time, as we're young and as we're carrying out the assignment of God um, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, that somehow, somewhere, somebody had became intimidated or despised our youth in this. And I remember even in the New Testament, um, that even Paul told Timothy, let no man despise thy youth. And so we find now, even in the 21st verse, I, I, I see where um, it says, Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. So Reuben, his brother, um, he, he steps in and he said, let's not kill him. Let's not kill him. And this is all happening before slavery, before he's even sold into slavery. He said, let's not kill him. And I would like to put parallel that to what Jesus does for us. That even in times which we will be slaved and persecuted um, and, and destroyed, he seems to step in in the midst of those times and keep those tactics from having their effectiveness. And so it goes on, and even after that, um, it tells us in the 24th verse, it says, And they took him and they cast him into a pit. So he came from being despised. They almost slayed him. Reuben stepped in and said no. And after he stepped in and said no, we can't slay him, they then threw him into a pit instead. Then Judah, his other brother, he said, well, we can't just leave him in here. We, how about we sell him into slavery? We can't just allow him to stay in this place. How about we pull him out and we push him away? Because I can't fathom, I can't imagine allowing my only brother um, to, to or one of my brothers should to leave or, or to be slain at our hands. I just can't even fathom that type of thing happening. And so Judah suggests that they pull him out of the pit and they sell him to slavery. And so we find ourselves around the 28th verse in which they begin to slave him, um, sell him to slavery. And so I would like to propose now that perhaps that the struggles in life that we endure, those things that we are set up for the demise for, are absolutely important towards us reaching 
using greatness in its context. What, what I would say today is that perhaps your struggles, our struggles, my struggles, the struggles that we all endure in life, the times that we're set up, the times that people plot against us, that somehow in some way that they are all used as a prerequisite for us achieving and reaching greatness. And so I want to take this a bit far and even try to and discover greatness for you a little bit and even for myself because I'm still fulfilling an assignment that my pastor gave me, which is to discover this greatness. And so what happens is we find as we fast forward past the 37th chapter and we find later in these scriptures that Joseph, he then was sold into slavery. He went to Potiphar's house. When he got to Potiphar's house, his wife tried to sleep with him and he didn't want to sleep with her. And so therefore she began to accuse that he tried to rape her. And so he told Potiphar that. Potiphar got mad and put him into prison. And so when he got to prison, he's there. And in both of these places, the Bible said he found favor while he was there. And so while he was there, he's in prison. And the Bible goes on to tell us that when he's in prison, he meets a baker and he meets a butler. And he begins to interpret their dreams. And he talk, tells them that whenever you leave here, I want you to remember me for my interpretation. I want you to make sure that you mention me to Pharaoh. And so what happens from there, he goes on, and the baker and the butler, they get out, and I believe it was the, the baker who died, but the butler, he lived, and, and he, he forgot about Joseph. The man that Joseph went out of his way to interpret his dreams, he forgot about Joseph. He was forsaken. And so what happens from there is, even after he forgot about him, there was a time when Pharaoh needed his dreams interpreted. And Joseph was the first person that the butler thinks about. He says, well, I met a man in prison who was able to interpret my dreams and they've come to pass. And so therefore, what happens next is Pharaoh says, well, bring him here. And he ter interpret Pharaoh's dreams and Pharaoh's excited um, about this man. He gets, uh, he gets so excited, so much so that he elevates him as emperor or to rule over the land and to handle his stuff. And so from there, there comes a moment when Joseph's brothers, they come when there's a famine in the land and they approach Joseph and Joseph recognizes them but they don't recognize him. And compassion fell upon his heart and he forgave his brothers so much so that he told them, go back, get my father, get my brother, bring them back. And he took care of them, he loved them and, and they had such a wonderful time. And so I would like to suggest that perhaps the definition of true greatness lies within forgiveness and it perhaps lies within love. That maybe greatness is not driving a Bentley and attending Harvard and, and Princeton and Yale and Southern Methodist University where I attend. Perhaps it's not having the biggest homes, the biggest cars, or, or even the world fame that Beyonce has. Perhaps. Greatness is the ability to literally be able to forgive somebody and love those that you may not agree with, love those that may have wronged you, may, maybe love those that may have differences in you. They may live a little different. They may talk a little different. They may come from a different social context. So the ability to literally still wrap your arms around somebody that may be totally different from you, y'all may not be on the same page, but you're still able to find somewhere in there this understanding that we've been given faith, hope, and love, but that love is the greatest among these things. That if the greatest commandment that he says that I've given you is that you love your neighbor. And so, so I, I'm excited today to understand even as I discovered this greatness that perhaps this greatness is love. That I love you as I love Christ. And, and I love you as I love Christ. And even though we may not always get along and even though you may have done something that may have wronged me every now and then, I still love you. And so Joseph was able to find that even through all of his struggles and through all of his oppositions, he went from being almost slain to thrown into a pit to being sold into slavery to going to Potiphar's house, to going into the prison and forgotten about by the butler, but ultimately to still be able to lick his brothers in the face and weep and say, I love you. It all had purpose. It all had divine destiny. See, he wasn't just sold into slavery. He was sold into greatness. He was sold into his purpose. So as we carry out the assignment that God has given us, our petition 
beckon us up to continue to hold the love of Christ in our hearts and forever in community, in ecumenical worship, work together to share with this entire world that Jesus Christ, our God, is love. God bless you.